Okay, so far we've covered the central executive and the phonological loop or sign loop. So the phonological and sign loop is about remembering and working with words. But what about things that aren't words? What about spatial information? Well, badly proposed another component called the visual spatial sketch pad um, that handles visual and spatial information. It's like a virtual reality for manipulating objects and space and how you might move through that space. And I'm going to talk about just uh, three studies that have tapped visual spatial processing in a way that's related to working memory. The first one is studies of mental rotation. And these were pioneered by Professor Roger Shepard at Stanford University. So Roger tells a story that he and his dog are playing frisbee or catch in the backyard. He throws the frisbee too hard and it goes over into the neighbor's yard. But there's a hole in the fence. There's a missing slot in the fence. So the dog runs through the slot, gets the frisbee in his mouth, runs back to the hole in the fence, and he's got a problem. He can't get the frisbee through the hole in the fence. The dog, according to Roger, the dog stops for a second, looks at the slot, rotates his head, rotates his head, and runs through. So Roger thought, aha, mental rotation. That dog calculated in his head how far he had to rotate that frisbee to get through the hole in the slot. So Roger and his students conducted a number of just elegant studies of mental rotation. Um, and what those studies involved was letters and shapes of different orientation. And the job of the subjects was to say, are these two letters the same letter or same letter with one, rotated in the picture plane one way or the other, or are they two different letters? So for example, if we look at the uh, top rectangle with two F's there, you can see that if you keep the F in the picture plane, there's no way to rotate one F until it locks on the other. It's the same problem as my hand, right? I, there's no orientation that I could rotate my hand in that will produce a perfect overlap. So they're two different shapes. Um, the bottom one, or the middle one, is also two different shapes. There's no way I can rotate one to have it lie perfectly on top of the other. But the bottom rectangle, do you see how you could rotate one of those shapes and remain in the picture plane so the, the F is on that piece of paper and it doesn't come off the piece of paper? Do you see how you could rotate one of those Fs so it would line up with the other? That's the task. Are they the same shape or two different shapes? And I'll show you some of his stimuli. So look at these two shapes real quickly and say, are they the same shape or two different shapes? Same or different? Same? Good. How about these two shapes? Same or different? Same? Good. And these two shapes? Same or different? Different. OK. You, in your head, you are capable of rotating objects around. Now, what's really interesting about what Professor Shepard found is the amount of time that it takes you to do that rotation is analogous to the amount of time it takes you to physically rotate something in space. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me take my handy post-it notes. I've got two post-it notes. One is a rotated version of the other, so I can easily go whoop, right? One rotates right on top of the other. But if, I, um, if the angle is not very big that separates the two of them, I can rotate very quickly to get one shape to overlap the other. But as the angle separating them gets bigger and bigger, it physically takes me more time to rotate one object so that it lays on top of the other. And if you can see that incredibly straight diagonal line, what Professor Shepard found was a perfect mapping between how long it takes you to rotate something in your head and how long it takes you to rotate something in the physical world. In other words, 
your visual spatial sketch pad literally is a simulation of how things work in the outside world, in the physical world. Uh, let me also tell you about a cool study by Helen Entraub, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Delaware. And she found this very cool phenomenon called boundary extension. Okay, I'm holding my eyeglass case and I'm holding it with my fingers. The only information I'm getting about this case is the information that comes from my individual fingers. But I feel a whole surface. How do I feel a whole surface when I only have information from four fingertips? There's all of this surface that I have no information on. And yet my brain automatically fills in that missing information. What uh, Professor Entraub found is that it looks as if our systems extend the boundaries of the scenes that we see. She's also done this work with uh, blind people and she ex blind people extend the boundaries of scenes that they feel. And the idea being by extending the boundary, it's like adding glue. If I could only perceive what each of my fingers feels, then I wouldn't feel anything in between my fingers. But what Professor Entraub has found is that our systems seem to extend beyond their original boundaries so that these missing empty spaces can be filled in. Let me just give you an example. I think that's clearer. Um, in the upper left-hand corner is a picture of some garbage cans. Below that is a drawing of one of the participants in her experiments where they would look at that photograph of garbage cans and then draw their memory of what they had seen. So you're supposed to draw, make a drawing that reproduces the picture that you just saw. Now if you compare the photograph above and the line drawing below, what do you notice? Well in the photograph I cannot see the outer edges of any of the trash cans, but in the drawing I can and I, I even see fencing. So my memory system, my working memory system has extended the boundaries of what I've actually seen. Uh, you can see another picture on the right with the same trash cans. If you show me that picture and then ask me to draw it, I extend the scenes even farther. Why would we do this? It seems to be a kind of glue, a, a bias that enables us to glue or integrate sensory information uh, beyond what we actually sense. And the third phenomenon I want to tell you about is something called representational momentum. Uh, we live in Los Angeles, so maybe for people who drive a lot, this will be important. Let's talk about physical momentum. So physical momentum says that the strength or the force of a moving object is a function of two things. Uh, the mass of that object and how fast it's going. So let me, the easy example. If I've got a little Honda Civic and a giant 18-wheeler truck and they're going at exactly the same speed and they hit their brakes at exactly the same time with exactly the same force, which one's going to stop sooner? The little Honda Civic, right? The, the, the car that has relatively less mass. It takes a very long time for a truck, which weighs a lot, to stop. That's why truck drivers, when they're driving on the freeway, they always leave more space in front of them because it takes them more time to stop. This is momentum. What Jennifer Fried at the University of Oregon found is that momentum also exists in your working memory. What she did was to show people uh, pictures or movies of events, physical events as they were unfolding. So one might be a picture of someone jumping off of a, um, a wall. So one, one video or set of pictures might depict someone jumping off of a wall. And let's say that when the person jumped off of the wall, when the person jumped off of a wall, they actually got to this location. Okay, so boop, they get here. What do we remember? 
if we have momentum, physical momentum embedded in our brains, then we should see that momentum bias our memories for locations of objects in space. And that is exactly what Jennifer Fried found. So when the person jumps off here and you show me this picture, what do I actually remember? I remember the picture a little farther along in its trajectory. So um, in the uh, picture of the man who's jumping here, maybe the last picture that I actually show you is this one, but that's not what people remember. What they remember is that the last picture was the one a little bit farther along the trajectory, as if it's hard for your brain to stop in midair. Right? So the argument is that uh, essentially your visual spatial sketch pad takes into account the constraints on movement in the physical world. Why would we want to do that? Why would we ever want to have a system that made an error by projecting into the future, into time, into, into the future? Well, think back to times when our ancestors had to worry about being on the wrong end of the food chain, right? When we were the prey, not the predator. Uh, we need to be able to outrun any animal that's coming towards us, we need to be able to predict where that animal is going. Actually, whether the animal is coming to eat us or whether we're running after an animal that we want to eat. So the assumption is that over evolutionary time, um, the need to extrapolate uh, and the ability to extrapolate visual spatial information accurately led to increased survival. Okay. That's it. Come right back and we'll talk about the next part of working memory.